Hillsboro Disaster, Wikipedia Audio The Hillsboro Disaster was a human crush at Hillsboro Football Stadium in Sheffield, England on April 15, 1989, during the 1988-89 FA Cup semi-final game between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest. The resulting 96 fatalities and 766 injuries makes this the worst disaster in British sporting history. The crush occurred in the two standing only central pens in the Leppings Lane stand, allocated to Liverpool supporters. Shortly before kickoff, in an attempt to ease overcrowding outside the entrance turnstiles, the police match commander, Chief Superintendent David Duck Enfield, ordered exit gate C to be opened, leading to an influx of even more supporters to the already overcrowded central pens. In the days and weeks following the disaster, police fed false stories to the press suggesting that hooliganism and drinking by Liverpool supporters were the root causes of the disaster. Blaming of Liverpool fans persisted even after the Taylor Report of 1990, which found that the main cause of the disaster was a failure of control by South Yorkshire Police. Following the Taylor Report, the Director of Public Prosecutions ruled there was no evidence to justify prosecution of any individuals or institutions. The disaster also led to a number of safety improvements in the largest English football grounds, notably the elimination of fenced standing terraces in favour of all-seater stadiums in the top two tiers of English football. The first coroner's inquest into the Hillsborough disaster, completed in 1991, ruled all deaths that occurred that day to be accidental. Families strongly rejected the original coroner's findings, and their fight to have the matter reopened persisted, despite Lord Justice Stuart Smith concluding in 1997 there was no justification for a new inquiry. Private prosecutions brought by the Hillsborough Families Support Group against Duck Enfield and his deputy Bernard Murray failed in 2000. Before the Disaster in 2009, a Hillsborough Independent Panel was formed to review all evidence. Reporting in 2012, it confirmed Taylor's 1990 criticisms, while also revealing new details about the extent of police efforts to shift blame onto fans, the role of other emergency services, and the error of the first coroner's inquest. The panel's report resulted in the previous findings of accidental death being quashed, and the creating of a new coroner's inquest. It also produced two criminal investigations led by police in 2012, Operation Resolve to look into the causes of the disaster, and by the Independent Police Complaints Commission to examine actions by police in the aftermath. The second coroner's inquest was held from April 1, 2014 to April 26, 2016. It ruled that the supporters were unlawfully killed due to grossly negligent failures by police and ambulance services to fulfill their duty of care to the supporters. The inquest also found that the design of the stadium contributed to the crush, and that supporters were not to blame for the dangerous conditions. Public anger over the actions of his force during the second inquest led the SYP Chief Constable David Crompton to be suspended following the verdict. In June 2017, six people were charged with various offences including manslaughter by gross negligence misconduct in public office and perverting the course of justice for their actions during and after the disaster. Rayu Bat, human rights lawyer, Christine Gifford, expert in the field of access to information, Katie Jones, investigative journalist, Bill Kirkup, associate chief medical officer in the Department of Health, Paul Layton, former Deputy Chief Constable of the Police Service of Northern Ireland, Professor Phil Scraton, expert in criminology, 
Peter Sissons, broadcaster, Sarah Tyak, formerly Chief Executive of the National Archives. Hillsborough Stadium in Sheffield, the home of Sheffield Wednesday, was selected by the Football Association as a neutral venue to host the FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest football clubs. Kick-off was scheduled for 3 p.m. on April 15, and fans were advised to take up positions 15 minutes beforehand. At the time of the disaster, most English football stadiums had high steel fencing between the spectators and the playing field in response to both friendly and hostile pitch invasions. Hooliganism had affected the sport for some years, and was particularly virulent in England. From 1974, when these security standards were put in place, crushes occurred in several English stadiums. A report by Eastwood and Partners for a safety certificate for the stadium in 1978 concluded that although it failed to meet the recommendations of the Green Guide, a guide to safety at sports grounds, the consequences were minor. It emphasized the general situation at Hillsborough was satisfactory compared with most grounds, 67. Risks associated with confining fans in pens were highlighted by the Committee of Inquiry into Crowd Safety at Sports Grounds after the Bradford City Stadium fire in May 1985. It made recommendations on the safety of crowds penned within fences, including that all exit gates should be manned at all times, and capable of being opened immediately from the inside by anyone in an emergency. Hillsborough hosted five FA Cup semi-finals in the 1980s. A crush occurred at the Leppings Lane end of the ground during the 1981 semi-final between Tottenham Hotspur and Wolverhampton Wanderers after hundreds more spectators were permitted to enter the terrace than could safely be accommodated, resulting in 38 injuries, including broken arms, legs and ribs. Police believed there had been a real chance of fatalities had swift action not been taken, and recommended the club reduce its capacity. In a post-match briefing to discuss the incident, Sheffield Wednesday chairman Bert McGee remarked, Bollocks no one would have been killed. The incident nonetheless prompted Sheffield Wednesday to alter the layout at the Leppings Lane end dividing the terrace into three separate pens to restrict sideways movement. This 1981 change and other later changes to the stadium invalidated the stadium's safety certificate. The safety certificate was never renewed and the stated capacity of the stadium was never changed. The terrace was divided into five pens when the club was promoted to the first division in 1984 and a crush barrier near the access tunnel was removed in 1986 to improve the flow of fans entering and exiting the central enclosure. Flames were added either side of the Liverpool FC crest in memory of the 96 fans who lost their lives in the Hillsborough disaster, alongside the Shankly Gates at Anfield, Liverpool's home stadium, a memorial at Hillsborough Stadium unveiled on the 10th anniversary of the disaster on April 15, 1999, reads, in memory of the 96 men, women and children who tragically died and the countless people whose lives were changed forever. FA Cup Semi-Final Liverpool v Nottingham Forest April 15, 1989 You'll never walk alone, a memorial stone in the pavement on the south side of Liverpool's Anglican Cathedral, a memorial garden in Hillsborough Park with a You'll Never Walk Alone gateway, a headstone at the junction of Middlewood Road, Leppings Lane and Wadsutty Lane, near the ground and by the Sheffield Super Tram route, a Hillsborough Memorial Rose Garden in Port Sunlight, Whirl a memorial rose garden on Sudley Estate in South Liverpool. Each of the six rose beds has a centerpiece of a white standard rosebush, surrounded by red rose bushes, 
named Liverpool Remember. There are brass memorial plagues on both sets of gates to the garden, and a sundial inscribed with the words, Time marches on but we will always remember. In the grounds of Crosby Library, to the memory of the 18 football fans from Sefton who lost their lives in the Hillsborough disaster. The memorial, sited in a raised rose bed containing the Liverpool Remembers Red Rose, is made of black granite. It is inscribed in loving memory of the 96 football supporters who died at Hillsborough, Sheffield on April 15, 1989. Of those who lost their lives the following young men were from Sefton families. The memorial was unveiled on October 4, 1991 by the mayor of Sefton, Councillor Sid Whitby. The project was carried out by the council after consultation with the Sefton Survivors Group. After the crush in 1981, Hillsborough was not chosen to host an FA Cup semi-final for six years until 1987. Serious overcrowding was observed at the 1987 quarter-final between Sheffield Wednesday and Coventry City and again during the semi-final between Coventry City and Leeds United at Hillsborough. Leeds were assigned the Leppings Lane end. A Leeds fan described disorganisation at the turnstiles and no steward or police direction inside the stadium, resulting in the crowd in one enclosure becoming so compressed he was at times unable to raise and clap his hands. Other accounts told of fans having to be pulled to safety from above. Liverpool and Nottingham Forest met in the semi-final at Hillsborough in 1988 and fans reported crushing at the Leppings Lane end. Liverpool lodged a complaint before the match in 1989. One supporter wrote to the Football Association and Minister for Sport complaining, the whole area was packed solid to the point where it was impossible to move and where I, and others around me, felt considerable concern for personal safety. Jonathan Harvey's guiding star showed a father coming to terms with what had happened some years later, Lance Nielsen wrote waiting for Hillsborough about two Liverpool families waiting for news of their missing loved ones on the day, which leads to discussion of football safety and the culture of blame. Nielsen's play won him an award at the 1999 Liverpool Arts and Entertainment Awards and was highly praised by the Liverpool Press venue. Police presence at the previous year's FA Cup semi-final had been overseen by Chief Superintendent Brian L. Mole. Mole had supervised numerous police deployments at the stadium in the past. In October 1988 a probationary PC in Mole's F Division, South Yorkshire was handcuffed, photographed, and stripped by fellow officers in a fake robbery as a hazing prank. Four officers resigned and seven were disciplined over the incident. Chief Superintendent Mole himself was to be transferred to the Barnsley Division for career development reasons. The transfer was to be done with immediate effect on March 27, 1989. Meanwhile, Hillsborough was accepted as the FA Cup semi-final venue on March 20, 1989 by the Football Association. The first planning meeting for the semi-final took place on March 22 and was attended by newly promoted Chief Superintendent David Duck Enfield, not by Mole. No known minutes exist of this meeting. Although Mole could have been assigned the semi-final matches planning despite his transfer, that was not done. This left planning for the semi-final match to Duck Enfield, who had never commanded a sell-out football match before, and who had very little, if any training or personal experience in how to do so. As is common at domestic matches in England, opposing supporters were segregated. Nottingham Forest supporters were allocated the South Stands and Spian Cop on the East End, with a combined capacity of 29,800, 
reached by 60 turnstiles spaced along two sides of the ground. Liverpool supporters were allocated the north and west ends, holding 24,256 fans, reached by 23 turnstiles from a narrow concourse. Turnstiles numbered 1 to 10, 10 in all, provided access to 9,700 seats in the north stand, a further six turnstiles provided access to 4,456 seats in the upper tier of the west stand. Finally, seven turnstiles provided access to 10,100 standing places in the lower tier of the west stand. Although Liverpool had more supporters, Nottingham Forest was allocated the larger area, to avoid the approach routes of rival fans crossing. As a result of the stadium layout and segregation policy, turnstiles that would normally have been used to enter the north stand from the east were off-limits and all Liverpool supporters had to converge on a single entrance at Leppings Lane. On match day, radio and television advised fans without tickets not to attend. Rather than establishing crowd safety as the priority, clubs, local authorities and the police viewed their roles and responsibilities through the lens of hooliganism. Three chartered trains transported Liverpool supporters to Sheffield for a match fixture in 1988, but only one such train ran in 1989. The 350 passengers arrived on the grounds about 2.20 p.m. Many supporters wished to enjoy the day and were in no hurry to enter the stadium too early. Some supporters were delayed by roadworks while crossing the Pennines on the M62 motorway which resulted in minor traffic congestion. Between 2.30 p.m. and 2.40 p.m., there was a build-up of supporters outside the turnstiles facing Leppings Lane, eager to enter the stadium before the game began. At 2.46 p.m., the BBC's football commentator John Mosun had already noticed the imbalance of distribution of people in the Leppings Lane pens. While rehearsing for the match off-air, he suggested a nearby cameraman look as well. There's gaps, you know, in parts of the ground. Well, if you look at the Liverpool end, to the right of the goal, there's hardly anybody on those steps, that's it. Look down there. Outside the stadium, a bottleneck developed with more fans arriving than could be safely filtered through the turnstiles before 3 p.m. People presenting tickets at the wrong turnstiles and those who had been refused entry could not leave because of the crowd behind them but remained as an obstruction. Fans outside could hear cheering as the teams came on the pitch ten minutes before the match started, and as the match kicked off, but could not gain entrance. A police constable radioed control requesting that the game be delayed, as it had been two years before, to ensure the safe passage of supporters into the ground. The request to delay the start of the match by twenty minutes was declined. With an estimated 5,000 fans trying to enter through the turnstiles and increasing safety concerns, the police, to avoid fatalities outside the ground, opened a large exit gate that ordinarily permitted the free flow of supporters departing the stadium. Two further gates were subsequently opened to relieve pressure. After an initial rush, Thousands of supporters entered the stadium steadily at a fast walk. BBC television cameras were at the ground to record the game for match of the day. As the disaster unfolded, the events were relayed live to the Saturday sports show, Grandstand. In Ireland, Root also showed the disaster unfolding, as it was covering the match live through its programme Sports Stadium. Previous Incidents Yorkshire Police Command Changes When the gates were opened, thousands of fans entered a narrow tunnel leading to the rear of the terrace into two overcrowded central pens, 
creating pressure at the front. Hundreds of people were pressed against one another and the fencing by the weight of the crowd behind them. People entering were unaware of the problems at the fence, police or stewards usually stood at the entrance to the tunnel and, when the central pens reached capacity, directed fans to the side pens, but on this occasion, for reasons not fully explained, they did not. A BBC TV news report conjectured that if police had positioned two police horses correctly, they would have acted as breakwaters directing many fans into side pens, but on this occasion, it was not done. Disaster Build up Timeline Crush Sima's response to the crush The match between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest began as scheduled at 3 p.m. Fans were still streaming into pens 3 and 4 from the rear entrance tunnel as the match began. For some time, problems at the front of the Liverpool central goal pens went largely unnoticed except by those inside it, and by a few police at that end of the pitch. Liverpool's goalkeeper, Bruce Grobelar, reported fans from behind him pleading to him for help as the situation worsened. The police at first attempted to stop fans from spilling out of the pens, some believing this to be a pitch invasion. At approximately 3.05 p.m. in match action, Peter Beardsley kicked a shot which struck Nottingham Forest's goal bar. Possibly connected to the excitement, a surge in three Peruvian huevos caused one of its metal crush barriers to give way, thrusting people forward on top of one another, and into the pen's front fences. South Yorkshire Police Superintendent Greenwood realized the situation, and ran on the field to gain referee Ray Lewis's attention. Lewis stopped the match at 3 hours 5 minutes and 30 seconds as fans climbed the fence in an effort to escape the crush and went onto the track. By this time, a small gate in the fence had been forced open and some fans escaped via this route, as others continued to climb over the fencing. Other fans were pulled to safety by fans in the west stand above the Leppings Lane Terrace. The intensity of the crush broke more crush barriers on the terraces. Holes in the perimeter fencing were made by fans desperately attempting to rescue others. The crowd in the Leppings Lane stand overspilled onto the pitch, where many injured and traumatized fans congregated who had climbed to safety. Football players from both teams were ushered to their respective dressing rooms and told that there would be a 30-minute postponement. Those still trapped in the pens were packed so tightly that many victims died of compressive asphyxia while standing. Meanwhile, on the pitch, police, stewards, and members of the St. John Ambulance Service were overwhelmed. Many uninjured fans assisted the injured. Several attempted CPR and others tore down advertising hoardings to use as stretchers. Chief Superintendent John Nesbitt of South Yorkshire Police later briefed Michael Schurz by MP that leaving the rescue to the fans was a deliberate strategy, and is quoted as saying we let the fans help so that they would not take out their frustration on the police at a police federation conference. Reactions as events unfolded, some police officers were still deployed making a cordon three-quarters of the way down the pitch to prevent Liverpool supporters reaching the opposing supporters. Without public address announcements to explain the situation, many Nottingham Forest fans on the other end were chanting for their team and whistled their anger at what they saw as a pitch invasion, incensing some of the Liverpool supporters. Some fans tried to break through the cordon simply to ferry injured fans to waiting ambulances on the Nottingham Forest end but were forcibly turned back. The agreed-upon protocol for the South Yorkshire Metropolitan Ambulance Service, or SIMAS was that ambulances were to queue at the entrance to the gymnasium, 
termed the Casualty Reception Point, or CRP, 145 any individuals within the stadium in need of medical attention were to be delivered expeditiously by police and paramedics to the CRP, 142. The system of ferrying injured from any location within the stadium to the CRP required a formal declaration to be made by those in charge for it to take effect. 137,138 As this declaration was not immediately performed, confusion reigned over those attempting to administer aid on the pitch. This confusion migrated to the first responders waiting in ambulances at the CRP, a location which quickly deteriorated into an ambulance parking lot. 143 Some crews were hesitant to leave their vehicles unsure of whether patients were coming to them, or vice versa, 138 to 140 others who did leave their vehicles were then faced with the obstacles inherent in placing distance between oneself and one's equipment. As the panel explained in their report, the equipment was no use on the ambulance vehicle when critical early resuscitation was taking place some distance away on the pitch behind the Leppings Lane end and in the gymnasium. Some ambulance crew did take equipment when they left their vehicle, but there was no systematic direction to do so, not all did, and none initially had been given any information about the situation inside the stadium. 146 A total of 42 ambulances arrived at the stadium. 149 out of this number, two managed of their own accord to make their way onto the pitch while a third ambulance made its way onto the pitch at the direction of DCAO Hopkins, who felt its visibility might allay crowd concerns. 149 The remaining 39 ambulances were collectively able to transport approximately 149 people to either Northern General Hospital, Royal Hallamshire Hospital, or Barnsley Hospital for treatment, 149. Condolences flooded in from across the world, led by the Queen. Other messages came from Pope John Paul II, U.S. President George H.W. Bush, and the Chief Executive of Juventus amongst many others. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and Home Secretary Douglas Hurd visited Hillsborough the day after the disaster and met survivors. Anfield Stadium was opened on the Sunday to allow fans to pay tribute to the dead. Thousands of fans visited and the stadium filled with flowers, scarves and other tributes. In the following days more than 200,000 people visited the shrine inside the stadium. The following Sunday, a link of football scarves spanning the 1.6 km distance across Stanley Park from Goodison Park to Anfield was created, with the final scarf in position at 3.06 p.m. Elsewhere on the same day, a silence opened with an air raid siren at 3 o'clock was held in central Nottingham with the colours of Forest, Liverpool and Wednesday adorning Nottingham Council House. Disaster Appeal Fund At Liverpool Metropolitan Cathedral, a requiem mass attended by 3,000 people was held by the Catholic Archbishop of Liverpool, Derek Warlock. The first reading was read by Liverpool goalkeeper Bruce Grabelar. Liverpool players Ronnie Wellen, Steve Nicol, and former manager Joe Fagan carried the communion bread and wine. David Shepherd the Anglican Bishop of Liverpool, on holiday on the Scottish island of Barra on the day of the disaster, was airlifted by RAF helicopter to attend. The FA chief executive Graham Kelly, who had attended the match, said the FA would conduct an inquiry into what had happened. Speaking after the disaster, Kelly backed all Cedar stadiums, saying we must move fans away from the ritual of standing on terraces. Standing on terraces and the use of perimeter fencing around the pitch, the use of CCTV, 
the timing of football matches and policing of sporting events were factors for a subsequent inquiry to consider. Effect on Survivors UEFA President Jacques Georges caused controversy by describing the Liverpool supporters as beasts, wrongly suggesting that hooliganism was the cause of the disaster, which had occurred less than four years after the Heysel Stadium disaster. His remarks led to Liverpool FC calling for his resignation, but he apologised on discovering hooliganism was not the cause. At the 1989 FA Cup final between Liverpool and local rivals Everton, held just five weeks after the Hillsborough disaster, the players from both participating teams wore black armbands as a gesture of respect to the victims, with a minute's silence also observed. Victims Ages 1989 Coroner's Hearing during the final match of the 1988-89 English Football League season, contested on May 26, 1989 between Liverpool and second-place Arsenal, the Arsenal players presented flowers to fans in different parts of Anfield in memory of those who had died in the Hillsborough disaster. A disaster appeal fund was set up with donations of £500,000 from the government, £100,000 from Liverpool FC and £25,000 each from the cities of Liverpool, Sheffield, and Nottingham. Liverpool donated the share of the money they would have received for the game. Within days donations had passed £1 million, swelled by donations from individuals, schools, and businesses. Other fundraising activities included a factory records benefit concert and several fundraising football matches. Bradford City and Lincoln City, the teams involved in the Bradford City Stadium fire, met for the first time since the 1985 disaster in a game which raised £25,000. When the appeal closed the following year, it had raised over £12 million. Much of the money went to victims and relatives of those involved in the disaster and provided funds for a college course to improve the hospital phase of emergency care. In May 1989, a charity version of the Gary and the Pacemakers song Fairy Cross the Mirza was released in aid of those affected. The song featured Liverpool musicians Paul McCartney, Gary Marsden, Holly Johnson, and the Christians and was produced by Stock Aitken Waterman. It entered the UK singles chart at number one on May 20, remaining at the top for a total of three weeks. Although Gary and the pacemaker's earlier hit You'll Never Walk Alone had stronger ties to Liverpool FC, it was not used because it had recently been re-recorded for the Bradford City Stadium Fire Appeal. By the disaster's 10th anniversary in 1999, at least three people who survived were known to have committed suicide. Another survivor had spent eight years in psychiatric care. There were cases of alcoholism, drug abuse, and collapsed marriages involving people who had witnessed the events. The lingering effects of the disaster were seen as a cause, or contributory factor in all of these. A total of 96 people died as a result of injuries incurred during the disaster. 94, aged from 10 to 67 years old, died on the day, either at the stadium, in the ambulances, or shortly after arrival at hospital. A total of 766 people were reported to have suffered injuries although less than half required hospital treatment. The less seriously injured survivors who did not live in the Sheffield area were advised to seek treatment for their injuries at hospitals nearer to their homes. On April 19, the death toll reached 95 when 14-year-old Lee Nicole died in hospital after his life support machine was switched off. The death toll reached 96 in March 1993, 
when artificial feeding and hydration were withdrawn from 22-year-old Tony Bland after nearly four years, during which time he had remained in a persistent vegetative state showing no sign of improvement. This followed a legal challenge in the High Court by his family to have his treatment withdrawn, a landmark challenge which succeeded in November 1992. Andrew Devine, aged 22 at the time of the disaster, suffered similar injuries to Tony Bland and was also diagnosed as being in a persistent vegetative state. In March 1997 just before the 8th anniversary of the disaster it was reported he had emerged from the condition and was able to communicate using a touch-sensitive pad, and he had been showing signs of awareness of his surroundings for up to three years before. He is still alive as of 2015. Two sisters, three pairs of brothers, and a father and son were among those who died as were two men about to become fathers for the first time, 25-year-old Stephen Brown of Wrexham and 30-year-old Peter Thompson of Widnes. John Paul Gilhooley, aged 10, was the youngest person to die. His cousin, Stephen Gerrard, then aged 8, went on to become Liverpool F.C.S. captain. Gerard has said the disaster inspired him to lead the team he supported as a boy and become a top professional football player. The oldest person to die at Hillsborough was 67-year-old Gerard Barron, an older brother of the late Liverpool player Kevin Barron, who had been on the losing side in the 1950 FA Cup final. Stephen Whittle is considered by some to be the 97th victim of Hillsborough, as due to work commitments, he had sold his ticket to a friend, who then died in the disaster, the resulting feeling of survivor guilt is believed to be the main reason for his suicide in February 2011. The majority of victims that lost their lives were from Liverpool and Greater Merseyside. A further 20 were from counties adjacent to Merseyside. An additional three victims came from Sheffield with two more living in counties adjacent to South Yorkshire. The remaining 14 victims lived in other parts of England. Of those who died, 78 were aged under 30, 38 of whom were under 20, and all but three of the victims were aged under 50. Inquests into the deaths, commencing later in 1989, proved controversial. South Yorkshire coroner Stephen Popper limited the main inquest to events up to 3.15 p.m. on the day of the disaster nine minutes after the match was halted and the crowd spilled onto the pitch. Popper said this was because the victims were either dead, or brain dead, by 3.15 p.m. The decision angered the families many of whom felt the inquest was unable to consider the response of the police and other emergency services after that time. The inquest returned a verdict of accidental death on March 26, 1991, much to the dismay of the bereaved families, who had been hoping for a verdict of unlawful killing or an open verdict and for manslaughter charges to be brought against the officers who had been present at the disaster. Popper's decision was subsequently endorsed by the divisional court who considered it to have been justified in the light of the medical evidence available to him. Relatives later failed to have the inquest reopened to allow more scrutiny of police actions and closer examination of the circumstances of individual cases. One of the individual cases where the circumstances of death were not fully resolved was that of Kevin Williams the 15-year-old son of Ann Williams. Ann Williams, who died in 2013, rejected the coroner's decision that the Hillsborough victims, including her son, had died before 3.15 p.m., citing witness statements that described him showing signs of life at 4 p.m. She unsuccessfully appealed to the European Court of Human Rights in 2009.
The Hillsborough Independent Panel considered the available evidence and stated that the initial pathologist's opinion appeared definitive, but further authoritative opinions raised significant doubts about the accuracy of that initial opinion. 313 After the disaster, Lord Justice Taylor was appointed to conduct an inquiry into the events. The Taylor Inquiry sat for a total of 31 days and published two reports, an interim report which laid out the events of the day and immediate conclusions, and the final report which outlined general recommendations on football ground safety. This became known as the Taylor Report. Taylor concluded that policing on the day broke down and the main reason for the disaster was the failure of police control. Attention was focused on the decision to open the secondary gates, moreover, the kickoff should have been delayed, as had been done at other venues and matches. Sheffield Wednesday was also criticised for the inadequate number of turnstiles at the Leppings Lane end and the poor quality of the crush barriers on the terraces, respects in which failure by the club contributed to this disaster. Taylor found there was no provision for controlling the entry of spectators into the turnstile area. He dismissed the claim by senior police officers that they had no reason to anticipate problems, since congestion had occurred at both the 1987 and 1988 semi-finals. He said that the operational order and police tactics on the day failed to provide for controlling a concentrated arrival of large numbers should that occur in a short period. That it might so occur was foreseeable. The failure by the police to give the order to direct fans to empty areas of the stadium, was described by Taylor as a blunder of the first magnitude. There was no means for calculating when individual enclosures had reached capacity. A police officer ordinarily made a visual assessment before guiding fans to other pens. However, on the day of the disaster, by 2.52 p.m. when Gate C was opened, pens 3 and 4 were over full, to allow any more into those pens was likely to cause injuries to allow in a large stream was courting disaster. The report noted that the official capacity of the central pens was 2,200, that the health and safety executive found this should have been reduced to 1,693 due to crush barriers and perimeter gates, but actually an estimated 3,000 people were in the pens around 3 p.m. The report said when spectators first appeared on the track, the immediate assumption in the control room was that a pitch invasion was threatened. This was unlikely at the beginning of a match. It became still less likely when those on the track made no move towards the pitch. Here was no effective leadership either from control or on the pitch to harness and organize rescue efforts. No orders were given for officers to enter the tunnel and relieve pressure. Further that, the anxiety to protect the sanctity of the pitch has caused insufficient attention to be paid to the risk of a crush due to overcrowding. Lord Taylor regarded spectator allocation as irrelevant to the disaster. I do not consider choice of ends was causative of the disaster. Had it been reversed, the disaster could well have occurred in a similar manner but to Nottingham supporters. Lord Taylor concluded that the behaviour of Liverpool fans, including accusations of drunkenness, were secondary factors, and said that most fans were, not drunk, nor even the worse for drink. He concluded that this formed an exacerbating factor but that police, seeking to rationalize their loss of control, overestimated the element of drunkenness in the crowd. The report dismissed the theory, put forward by South Yorkshire Police, that fans attempting to gain entry without tickets or with forged tickets were contributing factors.
Taylor concluded his criticism of South Yorkshire police by describing senior officers in command as defensive and evasive witnesses who refused to accept any responsibility for error. In all some 65 police officers gave oral evidence at the inquiry. Sadly I must report that for the most part the quality of their evidence was in inverse proportion to their rank. Further stating, South Yorkshire police were not prepared to concede they were in any respect at fault in what occurred. He police case was to blame the fans for being late and drunk, and to blame the club for failing to monitor the pens. Such an unrealistic approach gives cause for anxiety as to whether lessons have been learned. The Taylor report had a deep impact on safety standards for stadiums in the UK. Perimeter and lateral fencing was removed and many top stadiums were converted to all-seated. Purpose-built stadiums for Premier League and most football league teams since the report are all-seater. Chester City FC S. Davis Stadium was the first English football stadium to fulfill the safety recommendations of the Taylor Report, with Millwall FC. S. The Den being the first new stadium to be built that fulfilled the recommendations. In July 1992, the government announced a relaxation of the regulation for the lower two English leagues. The Football Spectators Act does not cover Scotland but the Scottish Premier League chose to make all-seater stadiums a requirement of league membership. In England and Wales all-seating is a requirement of the Premier League and of the Football League for clubs who have been present in the championship for more than three seasons. Several campaigns have attempted to get the government to relax the regulation and allow standing areas to return to Premiership and Championship grounds. In May 1997, when the Labour Party came into office, Home Secretary Jack Straw ordered an investigation. It was performed by Lord Justice Stuart Smith. The appointment of Stuart Smith was not without controversy. At a meeting in Liverpool with relatives of those involved in Hillsborough in October 1997, he flippantly remarked have you got a few of your people or are they like the Liverpool fans, turn up at the last minute. He later apologised for his remark, saying it was not intended to offend. The terms of reference of his inquiry were limited to new evidence, that is, evidence which was not available or was not presented to the previous inquires, courts, or authorities. Therefore. Evidence such as witness statements which had been altered were classed as inadmissible. When he presented his report in February 1998, he concluded that there was insufficient evidence for a new inquiry into the disaster. In paragraph 5 of his summary, Lord Justice Stuart Smith said, I have come to the clear conclusion that there is no basis upon which there should be a further judicial inquiry or a reopening of Lord Taylor's inquiry. There is no basis for a renewed application to the Divisional Court or for the Attorney General to exercise his powers under the Coroner's Act 1988. I do not consider that there is any material which should be put before the Director of Public Prosecutions or the Police Complaints Authority which might cause them to reconsider the decisions they have already taken. Nor do I consider that there is any justification for setting up any further inquiry into the performance of the emergency and hospital services. I have considered the circumstances in which alterations were made to some of the self-written statements of South Yorkshire police officers, but I do not consider that there is any occasion for any further investigation. Importantly, Stuart Smith's report supported the coroner's assertion that evidence after 3.15 p.m. was inadmissible as that by 3.15 p.m. the principal cause of death that is, the crushing, was over. This was controversial as the subsequent response of the police and emergency services would not be scrutinized. 
announcing the report to the House of Commons, Home Secretary Jack Straw backed Stuart Smith's findings and said that I do not believe that a further inquiry could or would uncover significant new evidence or provide any relief for the distress of those who have been bereaved. However the determination by Stuart Smith was heavily criticised by the Justice Minister, Lord Falconer, who stated I am absolutely sure that Sir Murray Stuart Smith came completely to the wrong conclusion. Falconer added, it made the families in the Hillsborough disaster feel after one establishment cover-up, here was another. The Hillsborough Independent Panel was instituted in 2009 by the British government to investigate the Hillsborough disaster, to oversee the disclosure of documents about the disaster and its aftermath and to produce a report. On September 12, 2012, it published its report and simultaneously launched a website containing 450,000 pages of material collated from 85 organizations and individuals over two years. In the years after the disaster, the Hillsborough Family Support Group had campaigned for the release of all relevant documents into the public domain. After the disaster's 20th anniversary in April 2009, supported by the Culture Secretary, Andy Burnham, and Minister of State for Justice, Maria Eagle, the government asked the Home Office and Department of Culture, Media, and Sport to investigate the best way for this information to be made public. In April 2009, the Home Secretary Jackie Smith announced she had requested secret files concerning the disaster be made public. In December 2009, Home Secretary Alan Johnson said the Hillsborough Independent Panel's remit would be to oversee full public disclosure of relevant government and local information within the limited constraints set out in the disclosure protocol and consult with the Hillsborough families to ensure that the views of those most affected by the disaster are taken into account. An archive of all relevant documentation would be created and a report produced within two years explaining the work of the panel and its conclusions. The panel was chaired by James Jones, the Bishop of Liverpool. Other members were On September 12, 2012, the Hillsborough Independent Panel concluded that no Liverpool fans were responsible in any way for the disaster and that its main cause was a lack of police control. Crowd safety was compromised at every level and overcrowding issues had been recorded two years earlier. The panel concluded that up to 41 of the 96 who perished might have survived had the emergency services reactions and CO ordination been improved. The number is based on post-mortem examinations which found some victims may have had heart, lung, or blood circulation function for some time after being removed from the crush. The report stated that placing fans who were merely unconscious on their backs rather than in the recovery position, would have resulted in their deaths due to airway obstruction. Their report was in 395 pages and delivered 153 key findings. The findings concluded that 164 witness statements had been altered. Of those statements, 116 were amended to remove or change negative comments about South Yorkshire Police. South Yorkshire Police had performed blood alcohol tests on the victims some of them children, and ran computer checks on the National Police database in an attempt to impugn their reputation. The report concluded that the then-conservative MP for Sheffield Hallam, Irvine Patnick, passed inaccurate and untrue information from the police to the press. The panel noted that, despite being dismissed by the Taylor Report, the idea that alcohol contributed to the disaster proved remarkably durable. Documents disclosed confirm that repeated attempts were made to find supporting evidence for alcohol being a factor, and that available evidence was significantly misinterpreted. 
It noted the weight placed on alcohol in the face of objective evidence of a pattern of consumption modest for a leisure event was inappropriate. It has since fueled persistent and unsustainable assertions about drunken fan behavior. The evidence it released online, included altered police reports. Subsequent apologies were released by Prime Minister David Cameron on behalf of the government, Ed Mealy Band on behalf of the opposition, Sheffield Wednesday Football Club, South Yorkshire Police, and former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie, who apologized for making false accusations under the headline The Truth. Mackenzie said he should have written a headline that read The Lies, although this apology was widely discredited by the Hillsborough Family Support Group and Liverpool fans, as it was seen to be shifting the blame once again. After publication, the Hillsborough Family Support Group called for new inquests for the victims. They also called for prosecutions for unlawful killing, corporate manslaughter, and perversion of the course of justice in respect of the actions of the police both in causing the disaster and covering up their actions, and in respect of Sheffield Wednesday FC, Sheffield Council and the Football Association for their various responsibilities for providing, certifying and selecting the stadium for the fatal event. Calls were made for the resignation of police officers involved in the cover-up, and for Sheffield Wednesday, the police and the Football Association to admit their blame. Calls were also made for Sir Dave Richards to resign as chairman of the Premier League and give up his knighthood as a result of his conduct at Sheffield Wednesday at the time of the disaster. The Home Secretary called for investigations into law-breaking and promised resources to investigate individual or systematic issues. Taylor Inquiry On October 23, 2012, Norman Bet Eisen resigned with immediate effect as Chief Constable of West Yorkshire Police after Maria Eagle MP on the floor of the House and protected by parliamentary privilege accused him of boasting about concocting a story that all the Liverpool fans were drunk and police were afraid they were going to break down the gates and decided to open them. Bet Eisen denied the claim, and other allegations about his conduct, saying, fans' behaviour, to the extent that it was relevant at all, made the job of the police, in the crush outside Leppings Lane turnstiles, harder than it needed to be but it didn't cause the disaster any more than the sunny day that encouraged people to linger outside the stadium as kick-off approached. I held those views then, I hold them now. I have never, since hearing the Taylor evidence unfold, offered any other interpretation in public or private. Merseyside Police Authority confirmed that Bet Eisen would receive an £83,000 pension, unless convicted of a criminal offence. Hillsborough families called for the payments to be frozen during the IPCC investigation. In the same 22 October House of Commons debate, Stephen Mosley MP alleged West Midlands police pressured witnesses both police and civilians to change their statements. Maria Eagle confirmed her understanding that WMP actions in this respect would be the subject of IPCC scrutiny. Following an application on December 19, 2012 by the Attorney General Dominic Grieve, the High Court quashed the verdicts in the original inquests and ordered fresh inquests to be held. Sir John Goldring was appointed as Assistant Coroner for South Yorkshire and West Yorkshire to conduct those inquests. The inquest hearings started on Monday, March 31, 2014 at Warrington. Transcripts of the proceedings and evidence that was produced during the hearings were published at the Hillsborough Inquest's official website. On April 6, 2016, the nine jurors were sent out to consider their verdicts. 
These were formally given to the inquest at 11 o'clock on April 26, 2016. The jury returned a verdict of unlawful killing in respect of all 96 victims. Upon receiving the April 2016 verdict, Hillsborough Family Support Group Chair Margaret Aspinall, whose 18-year-old son James was killed in the disaster, said. Let's be honest about this people were against us. We had the media against us, as well as the establishment. Everything was against us. The only people that weren't against us was our own city. That's why I am so grateful to my city and so proud of my city. They always believed in us. Prime Minister David Cameron also responded to the April 2016 verdict by saying that it represented a long overdue but landmark moment in the quest for justice, adding all families and survivors now have official confirmation of what they always knew was the case that the Liverpool fans were utterly blameless in the disaster that unfolded at Hillsborough. The Labour Party described the handling of the Hillsborough disaster as the greatest miscarriage of justice of our times, with Labour MPs Andy Burnham and Steve Rotheram calling for accountability and the prosecution of those responsible. Liberal Democrat MP John Pugh called for David Cameron to make a formal apology in the House of Commons to the families of those killed at Hillsborough and to the city of Liverpool as a whole. Kelvin McKenzie, who wrote the now infamous The Truth front page for The Sun, said that although he was duped into publishing his story, that his heart goes out to the families of those affected saying that it's quite clear today the fans had nothing to do with it. However, Mackenzie did not accept any personal responsibility for the story. Police Control During the inquest, Maxwell Groom a police constable at the time of the disaster made allegations of a high-level conspiracy by Freemasons to shift blame for the disaster onto Superintendent Roger Marshall also that junior officers were pressured into changing their statements after the disaster, and told not to write their accounts in their official police pocketbooks. Groom also claimed that Match Commander Duck Enfield was a member of the highly influential Dole Lodge in Sheffield Coroner Sir John Goldring warned the jury that there was not a shred of evidence that any Masonic meeting actually took place, or that those named were all Freemasons advising the jury to cast aside gossip and hearsay. During the inquest, Duck Enfield confirmed that he became a Freemason in 1975 and became worshipful master of his local lodge in 1990, a year after the disaster. Following this revelation, Freemasons were forbidden to take part in the IPCC investigation as civilian investigators to prevent any perceived bias. Following the inquest verdict, South Yorkshire Police announced it would refer the actions of its officers to the Independent Police Complaints Commission. West Yorkshire Police announced it would refer its chief constable, Norman Bet Eisen, to the IPCC in mid-September. Bet Eisen, had been one of a number of police officers who were accused of manipulating evidence by the Hillsborough Independent Panel. In early October, Bet Eisen announced his retirement, becoming the first senior figure to step down since publication of the panel's report. Behavior of Fans The IPCC announced on October 12, 2012 that it would investigate the failure of the police to declare a major incident, failure to close the tunnel to the stands which led to overcrowded pens despite evidence it had been closed in such circumstances in the past, changes made to the statements of police officers, actions which misled Parliament and the media, shortcomings of previous investigations, and the role played by Norman Bet Eisen. By October 22, 2012, 
the names of at least 1,444 serving and former police officers had been referred to the IPCC investigation. In its announcement, the IPCC praised the tenacity of the Hillsborough family's campaign for truth and justice. On October 16, 2012, the Attorney General announced in Parliament he had applied to have the original inquest verdict quashed, arguing it proceeded on a false basis and evidence now to hand required this exceptional step. Police Evasion Effect on Stadiums in Britain On July 12, 2013, it was reported that the IPCC had found that in addition to the now 164 police statements known to have been altered, a further 55 police officers had changed their statements. Deborah Glass, deputy chair of the IPCC said, We know the people who have contacted us are the tip of the iceberg. That was after the IPCC's Hillsborough contact team had received 230 pieces of correspondence since October 2012. The IPCC is also investigating the actions of West Midlands Police, who in 1989 had been tasked with investigating South Yorkshire Police's conduct for both the original inquest and also the Taylor Independent Inquiry. In April 2016, the Crown Prosecution Service announced that it would consider bringing charges against both individuals and corporate bodies once the criminal investigation by the Independent Police Complaints Commission Operation Resolve had been completed. Stuart Smith Scrutiny Hillsborough Independent Panel History Findings Effects Second Coroner's Hearing Independent Police Complaints Commission Investigation Criminal and Civil Cases Prosecutions Psychiatric Injury and Other Litigation Memorials Permanent Memorials Memorial Ceremonies 10th Anniversary 20th Anniversary Other Tributes In February 2000, a private prosecution was brought against Chief Superintendent David Duck Enfield and another officer, Bernard Murray. The prosecution argued that the crush was foreseeable hence the defendants were grossly negligent. Prosecutor Alan Jones told the court that Duck Enfield gave the order to open the gates so that hundreds of fans could be herded onto the already crowded terraces at the stadium. Jones stated that minutes after the disaster, Duck Enfield deceitfully and dishonestly told senior FA officials that the supporters had forced the gate open. Duck Enfield admitted he had lied in certain statements regarding the causes of the disaster. The prosecution ended on July 24, 2000, when Murray was acquitted and the jury was unable to reach a verdict in the case of Duck Enfield. On July 26, 2000, the judge refused the prosecution's application for a retrial of Duck Enfield. Police disciplinary charges were abandoned when Duck Enfield retired on health grounds and, because he was unavailable, it was decided it would be unfair to proceed with disciplinary charges against Bernard Murray. Duck Enfield took medical retirement on a full police pension. Home Secretary Theresa May announced on December 18, 2012 that a new police inquiry would be initiated to examine the possibility of charging agencies other than the police over the Hillsborough deaths. The inquiry was headed by former Durham Chief Constable John Stoddart. Now it is headed by Assistant Commissioner Rob Beckley. On June 28, 2017, it was announced that six people were to be charged with offences in relation to the disaster. Former Chief Superintendent David Duck Enfield, in charge of the match, 
faces 95 counts of manslaughter by gross negligence. He faces no charge in respect of the death of Tony Bland, who died four years after the disaster. Former Chief Inspector Sir Norman Bedenson faces four counts of misconduct in public office. Former Sheffield Wednesday FC Club Secretary Graham McCrell faces a charge of breaching the Safety at Sports Ground Act 1975. Solicitor Peter Metcalf, former Chief Superintendent Donald Denton and former Detective Chief Inspector Alan Foster were all charged with perverting the course of justice. On August 9, all except Duck Enfield appeared at Warrington Magistrates Court. McCrell pleaded not guilty to the charge against him. No formal pleas were taken from the other four defendants. All five were bailed to appear at the Crown Court on September 6. Duck Enfield was not required to appear as the Crown Prosecution Service has to apply to the High Court to lift a court order before he can be prosecuted on the manslaughter charges. In December 2017, it was announced that a police officer and a farrier would not be prosecuted over allegations that they fabricated a story about a police horse being burned with cigarettes at Hillsborough. Although there was enough evidence to charge the farrier with perverting the course of justice, it was felt not to be in the public interest to charge him. There was insufficient evidence against the police officer to charge him with the offence. Various negligence cases were brought against the police by spectators who had been at the ground but had not been in the pens, and by people who watched the incident unfolding on television. A case, Alcock v. Chief Constable of South Yorkshire Police 1 AC 310, was eventually appealed to the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords and was an important milestone in the law of claims of secondary victims for negligently inflicted psychiatric injury. It was held that claimants who watched the disaster on television slash listened on radio were not proximal and their claims were rejected. Another psychiatric injury claim was brought to the House of Lords. White v. Chief Constable of the South Yorkshire Police 2 AC 455. It was brought by police officers on duty against the Chief Constable who was said to have been vicariously liable for the disaster. Their claims were dismissed and the Alcock decision was upheld. It affirmed the position of the courts once again towards claims of psychiatric injuries of secondary victims. Controversies A third legal case which resulted from the Hillsborough disaster was Airedale NHS. Trust v. Bland AC 789, a landmark House of Lords decision in English criminal law, that allowed the life support machine of Tony Bland, a Hillsborough victim in a persistent vegetative state, to be switched off. In April 2016, a private prosecution was launched on behalf of victims' relatives against both SYP and the West Midlands Police Force, alleging a concerted cover-up designed to shift blame away from the police. Several memorials have been erected in memory of the victims of the Hillsborough disaster, all are listed below. Media Portrayal the disaster has been acknowledged on April 15 each year by the community in Liverpool and football in general. An annual memorial ceremony is held at Anfield and at a church in Liverpool. The 10th and 20th anniversaries were marked by special services to remember the victims. From 2007, there was a Hillsborough memorial service held at Spian Cop, KwaZulu-Natal. South Africa annually. The ceremony is held on the Spian Cop battlefield which gave its name to the cop stand at Anfield. There is a permanent memorial to the 96 fans who died, in the form of a bench in view of the battlefield at a nearby lodge. Dean Davis and David Walters, South African Liverpool supporters, 
are responsible for the service and the bench was commissioned by Guy Prowse in 2008. Following on from, and out of respect for the Hillsborough family's decision to conclude official memorials at Anfield as of 2016, there will be no further memorials held at Spian Cop. The memorial bench remains at Spian Cop Lodge. The Sun In 2014, the FA decided all FA Cup, Premier League, Football League and Football Conference matches played between 11-14 April, would kick off seven minutes later than originally scheduled with a six-minute delay and a one-minute silence tribute. In 1999, Anfield was packed with a crowd of around 10,000 people ten years after the disaster. A candle was lit for each of the 96 victims. The clock at the cop end stood still at 3.06 p.m., the time that the referee had blown his whistle in 1989 and a minute's silence was held, the start signaled by match referee from that day, Ray Lewis. A service led by the Right Reverend James Jones, the Bishop of Liverpool, was attended by past and present Liverpool players, including Robbie Fowler, Steve McManaman and Alan Hansen. According to the BBC report, the names of the victims were read from the memorial book and floral tributes were laid at a plaque bearing their names. A gospel choir performed and the ceremony ended with a rendition of You'll Never Walk Alone. The anniversary was also marked by a minute's silence at the weekend's league games and FA Cup semi-finals. The Times In 2009, on the 20th anniversary of the disaster, Liverpool's request that their Champions League quarter-finals return leg, scheduled for April 15, be played the day before was granted. The event was remembered with a ceremony at Anfield attended by over 28,000 people. The COP, Centenary and main stands were opened to the public before part of the Anfield Road end was opened to supporters. The memorial service, led by the Bishop of Liverpool began at 1445 BST and a two-minute silence was held at the time of the disaster 20 years earlier, 1506 BST. Sports Minister Andy Burnham addressed the crowd but was heckled by supporters chanting justice for the 96. The ceremony was attended by survivors of the disaster, families of victims and the Liverpool team with goalkeeper Pepe Reina leading the team and management staff onto the pitch. Team captain Steven Gerrard and vice-captain Jamie Carragher handed the freedom of the city to the families of all the victims. Candles were lit for each of the 96 people who died. Kenny Dalglish, Liverpool's manager at the time of the disaster, read a passage from the Bible, Lamentations of Jeremiah. The Liverpool manager, Rafael Benitez, set 96 balloons free. The ceremony ended with 96 rings of church bells across the city in a rendition of You'll Never Walk Alone. Other services took place at the same time, including at Liverpool's Anglican and Catholic cathedrals. After the two minutes silence, bells on civic buildings rang out throughout Merseyside. A song was released to mark the 20th anniversary, entitled Fields of Anfield Road which peaked at number 14 in the UK charts. FHM Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal and Manchester United players showed respect by wearing black armbands during their Champions League matches on 14 and April 15. On May 14, more than 20,000 people packed Anfield for a match held in memory of the victims. The Liverpool legends, comprising ex-Liverpool footballers beat the All-Stars, captained by actor Ricky Tomlinson, 3-1. The event also raised cash for the Marina Dalglish appeal which was contributed towards a radiotherapy centre at University Hospital in Aintree.
the spectator. With the imminent release of police documents relating to events on April 15, 1989, the Hillsborough Family Support Group launched Project 96, a fundraising initiative on August 1, 2009. At least 96 current and former Liverpool footballers are being lined up to raise £96,000 by auctioning a limited edition signed photographs. EastEnders On April 11, 2009, Liverpool fans sang You'll Never Walk Alone as a tribute to the upcoming anniversary of the disaster before the home game against Blackburn Rovers and was followed by former Liverpool player, Stephen Warnock presenting a memorial wreath to the cop showing the figure 96 in red flowers. Charles Attange The Hillsborough disaster touched not only Liverpool, but clubs in England and around the world. Supporters of Everton, Liverpool's traditional local rivals, were affected, many of them having lost friends and family. Supporters laid down flowers and blue and white scarves to show respect for the dead and unity with fellow Merseysiders. Jeremy Hunt Fans Chance Oliver Popplewell David Crompton On April 19, 1989, the Wednesday after the disaster, the European Cup semi-final tie between AC Milan and Real Madrid was played. The referee blew his whistle two minutes into the game to stop play and hold a minute's silence for those who lost their lives at Hillsborough. Halfway through the minute's silence, the AC. Milan fans sang Liverpool's You'll Never Walk Alone as a sign of respect. In April 1989, Bradford City and Lincoln City held a friendly match to benefit the victims of Hillsborough. The occasion was the first in which the two teams had met since the 1985 Bradford City Stadium fire that had claimed 56 lives at Valley Parade. Civil Servant On April 30, 1989, a match organised by Celtic FC was played at Celtic Park. Glasgow between the home club and Liverpool, the proceeds going to the Hillsborough Fund. Liverpool won the match by four goals to nil. Stephen Cohen Bernard Ingham Topman Television and Theatre 1989, After Dark 1996 Drama 2014-2016 Documentary Stage Plays As a result of the disaster, Liverpool's scheduled fixture against Arsenal was delayed from April 23 until the end of the season and eventually decided the league title. At this fixture, Arsenal players brought flowers onto the pitch and presented them to the Liverpool fans around the stadium before the game commenced. During a 2011 debate in the House of Commons, the Labour MP for Liverpool Walton, Steve Rotheram, read out a list of the victims and, as a result, the names were entered into Hansard. Initial media coverage spurred by what Phil Scraton calls in Hillsborough, the truth the Heisel factor and hooligan hysteria began to shift the blame onto the behaviour of the Liverpool fans at the stadium making it a public order issue. As well as The Sun's April 19, 1989 The Truth article other newspapers published similar allegations, the Daily Star headline on the same day reported dead fans robbed by drunk thugs, the Daily Mail accused the Liverpool fans of being drunk and violent and their actions were vile and the Daily Express ran a story alleging that police saw sick spectacle of pilfering from the dying dot.
Peter McKay in the Evening Standard wrote that the catastrophe was caused first and foremost by violent enthusiasm for soccer and in this case the tribal passions of Liverpool supporters literally killed themselves and others to be at the game and published a front page headline Police Attack Vile Fans on April 18, 1989 in which police sources blamed the behavior of a section of Liverpool fans for the disaster. In regional newspapers, the Liverpool Daily Post wrote in an article titled I Blame the Yobs that the gate crashers wreaked their fatal havoc. Their uncontrolled fanaticism and mass hysteria, literally squeezed the life out of men, women, and children, yobism at its most base. Scouse killed Scouse for no better reason than 22 men were kicking a ball, the Manchester Evening News wrote that the Anfield army charged onto the terrace behind the goal many without tickets, and the Yorkshire Post wrote that the trampling crush had been started by thousands of fans who were a latecomers, forked their way into the ground. The Sheffield Star published similar allegations to The Sun running the headline fans in drunken attacks on police. Many of the more serious allegations such as stealing from the dead and assault of police officers and rescue workers appeared on April 18, although several evening newspapers published on April 15, 1989 also gave an accurate reporting of the disaster as these newspapers went to press before the full extent or circumstances of the disaster had been confirmed or even reported. This included the Wolverhampton-based Express and Star, which reported that the match had been cancelled as a result of a pitch invasion in which many fans were injured. This article was presumably published before there were any reports that people had been killed. These media reports and others were examined during the 2012 Hillsborough Independent Panel Report. On April 19, four days after the disaster, Kelvin McKenzie, editor of The Sun, ordered The Truth as the front page headline, followed by three sub headlines Some fans picked pockets of victims. Some fans urinated on the brave cops and some fans beat up PC giving kiss of life. Mackenzie reportedly spent two hours deciding on which headline to run, his original instinct being for you scum before eventually deciding on the truth. The information was provided to the newspaper by White's news agency in Sheffield, the newspaper cited claims by police inspector Gordon Sykes that Liverpool fans had pickpocketed the dead, as well as other claims by unnamed police officers and local Conservative MP Irvine Patnick. The Daily Express also carried Patnick's version, under the headline Police Accused Drunken Fans which gave Patnick's views, saying he had told Margaret Thatcher, while escorting her on a tour of the ground after the disaster of the mayhem caused by drunks and that policemen told him they were hampered, harassed, punched, and kicked. The story accompanying the Sun headlines claimed drunken Liverpool fans viciously attacked rescue workers as they tried to revive victims and police officers, firemen, and ambulance crew were punched, kicked and urinated upon. A quotation, attributed to an unnamed policeman, claimed a partially unclothed dead girl had been verbally abused, and that Liverpool fans were openly urinating on us and the bodies of the dead. In fact many Liverpool fans helped security personnel stretcher away victims and gave first aid to the injured. The Guardian later wrote that the claim that supporters higher up the Leppings Lane Terrace had urinated on police pulling bodies out of the crush appeared to have roots in the fact that those who were dying or sustaining serious injuries suffered compression asphyxia and many involuntarily urinated, vomited, and emptied their bowels as they were crushed. In their History of the Sun, Peter Chippendale and Chris Horry wrote, as Mackenzie's layout was seen by more and more people, 
a collective shudder ran through the office Mackenzie's dominance was so total there was nobody left in the organization who could rein him in except Murdoch. Seemed paralyzed looking like rabbits in the headlights as one hack described them. The error staring them in the face was too glaring. It obviously wasn't a silly mistake, nor was it a simple oversight. Nobody really had any comment on it they just took one look and went away shaking their heads in wonder at the enormity of it. It was a classic smear. After the Sun's report, the newspaper was boycotted by most news agents in Liverpool and many readers cancelled their orders and refused to buy it from news agents, and from then afterwards many in Liverpool refer to the Sun newspaper as the scum. Some even refused to say the name or spell it as the S asterisk N. The Hillsborough Justice Campaign organized a less successful national boycott that had some impact on the paper's sales nationally. Mackenzie explained his actions in 1993. Talking to a House of Commons National Heritage Select Committee, he said, I regret Hillsborough. It was a fundamental mistake. The mistake was I believed what an MP said. It was a Tory MP. If he had not said it and the chief superintendent had not agreed with it, we would not have gone with it. Mackenzie retracted the apology in November 2006, saying he apologized because the newspaper's owner, Rupert Murdoch, had ordered him to do so, stating, I was not sorry then and I'm not sorry now. Mackenzie refused to apologize when appearing on the BBC's topical question time on January 11, 2007. The Sun apologized for its treatment of the Hillsborough disaster without reservation in a full-page opinion piece on July 7, 2004 saying it had committed the most terrible mistake in its history by publishing it. The apology angered some Liverpudlians further. The Liverpool Echo called the apology, shabby and an attempt, once again, to exploit the Hillsborough dead. James Murdoch made a full apology for the Sun's coverage when he appeared at a hearing of the House of Commons Select Committee dealing with the News International phone hacking scandal in 2012. On September 12, 2012, after the publication of the report exonerating the Liverpool fans, Mackenzie issued the following statement. Today I offer my profuse apologies to the people of Liverpool for that headline. I too was totally misled. Twenty-three years ago I was handed a piece of copy from a reputable news agency in Sheffield, in which a senior police officer and a senior local MP were making serious allegations against fans in the stadium. I had absolutely no reason to believe that these authority figures would lie and deceive over such a disaster. As the Prime Minister has made clear, these allegations were wholly untrue and were part of a concerted plot by police officers to discredit the supporters thereby shifting the blame for the tragedy from themselves. It has taken more than two decades, 400,000 documents and a two-year inquiry to discover to my horror that it would have been far more accurate had I written the headline The Lies Rather Than The Truth. I published in good faith and I am sorry that it was so wrong. In response, Trevor Hicks, chairman of the Hillsborough Family Support Group, rejected Mackenzie's apology as too little, too late calling him lowlife, clever lowlife, but lowlife. A press conference held by families of the victims also banned all Sun reporters from entering, with a sign on the door reading no entry to Sun journalists. Sales of the Sun remain poor in Merseyside and a boycott is still practiced. In 2004, its average circulation in Liverpool was 12,000 copies a day. 
Following the April 2016 verdict of unlawful killing, The Sun and the first print edition of The Times did not cover the stories on their front pages, with The Sun relegating the story to pages 8 and 9. An apology appeared on page 10, reiterating previous statements that the 1989 headline had been an error of judgment. The coverage was widely condemned on social media with Twitter users saying that this reflected Murdoch's view on Hillsborough, which was a smear, which now daren't speak its name. On the night of the verdict coverage, more than 124,000 tweets used the term The Sun. However, on Sky News, The Sun's political editor Tom Newton Dunn defended this decision, saying I don't think it should all be about the sun it was not us who committed Hillsboro. Trevor Kavanaugh, the political editor at the time of the Hillsboro disaster, said that he was not sorry at all about the reporting and supported his former boss Calvin McKenzie, claiming that we were clearly misled about the events and the authorities, including the police, actively concealed the truth. In February 2017, Liverpool FC issued a ban on the Sun journalists from entering their grounds in response to the coverage of Hillsborough by the newspaper. Everton FC followed in April 2017 on the eve of the 28th anniversary of the disaster after a column by Kelvin McKenzie concerning Everton footballer Ross Barkley. McKenzie was suspended as a contributor to the newspaper. The journalist Edward Pierce was criticized for writing a controversial article in the aftermath of the disaster, at a time when a number of victims' funerals were taking place. His article in the Sunday Times on April 23, 1989, included the text. For the second time in half a decade a large body of Liverpool supporters has killed people, the shrine in the Anfield Goalmouth the cursing of the police, all the theatricals, come sweetly to a city which is already the world capital of self-pity. There are soapy politicians to make a pet of Liverpool, and Liverpool itself is always standing by to make a pet of itself. Why us? Why are we treated like animals? To which the plain answer is that a good and sufficient minority of you behave like animals. Pierce went on reflect that if South Yorkshire police bore any responsibility, it was for not realising what brutes they had to handle. Professor Phil Scraton described Pierce's comments as amongst the most bigoted and factually inaccurate published in the wake of the disaster. A number of complaints were made to the press council concerning the article but the council ruled that it was unable to adjudicate on comment pieces, though the council noted that tragedy or disaster is not an occasion for writers to exercise gratuitous provocation. On April 27, 2016, Time staffers in the sports department expressed their outrage over the paper's decision to cover April 26 inquest which ruled that the 96 dead were unlawfully killed, only on an inside spread in the sports pages, with some in the newspaper claiming there was a mutiny in the sports department. The Times later tweeted that we made a mistake with the front page of our first edition, and we fixed it for our second edition. The Times was the only major UK newspaper not to give the story front page coverage other than fellow News UK owned Sunday. Gary Leinker described the incident as disgusting as it is unsurprising, and David Walsh, chief sports writer at the Sunday Times, said it was a shocking misjudgment to not include this story on the front page. However, Insiders dismissed any suggestion that a visit by News UK owner Rupert Murdoch to the Times newsroom on the day of the verdict had anything to do with the editorial decision. 
The November 2002 edition of the men's lifestyle magazine FHM in Australia was swiftly withdrawn from sale soon after its publication, and a public apology made in the Australian and British editions, because it contained jokes mocking the disaster. As a result, EMAP Australia, who owned FHM at the time, pledged to make a donation to the families of the victims. Although the original apology was not printed in the magazine as it was not considered serious enough, its Australian editor, Jeff Campbell, released a statement, We deeply regret the photograph captions published in the November issue of the Australian edition of FHM, accompanying an article about the Hillsborough disaster of 1989. The right course of action is to withdraw this edition from sale which we will be doing. We have been in contact with the Hillsborough Family Support Group and the Hillsborough Justice Campaign to express our deep regret and sincere apologies. The British edition disassociated itself from the controversy, stating, FHM Australia has its own editorial team and these captions were written and published without consultation with the UK edition, or any other edition of FHM. The vice chairman of the Hillsborough Family Support Group, Philip Hammond, said he wanted all football fans to boycott the magazine, saying, I am going to write to every fanzine in the country including Liverpool F.CS telling them to ban FHM. People are very upset by it. I think there will be a real boycott. He added it would be like making jokes about the 2002 Bali bombings, in which eight fewer Australians were killed. The publication was finally discontinued in 2016 for unrelated reasons. The Spectator, was criticized for an editorial which appeared in the magazine on October 16, 2004 following the death of British hostage Kenneth John Ken Bigley in Iraq, in which it was claimed that the response to Bigley's killing was fueled by the fact he was from Liverpool and went on to criticize the drunken fans at Hillsborough and call on them to accept responsibility for their role in the disaster. The extreme reaction to Mr. Bigley's murder is fed by the fact that he was a Liverpudlian. Liverpool is a handsome city with a tribal sense of community. A combination of economic misfortune its docks were, fundamentally, on the wrong side of England when Britain entered what is now the European Union and an excessive predilection for welfareism have created a peculiar, and deeply unattractive, psyche among many Liverpudlians. They see themselves whenever possible as victims, and resent their victim status, yet at the same time they wallow in it. Part of this flawed psychological state is that they cannot accept that they might have made any contribution to their misfortunes, but seek rather to blame someone else for it, thereby deepening their sense of shared tribal grievance against the rest of society. The deaths of more than 50 Liverpool football supporters at Hillsborough in 1989 was undeniably a greater tragedy than the single death, however horrible, of Mr. Bigley but that is no excuse for Liverpool's failure to acknowledge, even to this day, the part played in the disaster by drunken fans at the back of the crowd who mindlessly tried to fight their way into the ground that Saturday afternoon. The police became a convenient scapegoat, and the Sun newspaper a whipping boy for daring, albeit in a tasteless fashion, to hint at the wider causes of the incident. Although the then-editor Boris Johnson did not write this piece, journalist Simon Heffer alleged he had written the first draft of the article at Mr. Johnson's request, and offered to apologize for its publication after it attracted a furor in the city. Johnson apologized at the time of the article, traveling to Liverpool to do so and again following the publication of the report of the Hillsborough Independent Panel in 2012, however, Johnson's apology was rejected by Margaret Aspinall, 
chairperson of the Hillsborough Families Support Group, whose son James, 18, died in the disaster. What he has got to understand is that we were speaking the truth for 23 years and apologies have only started to come today from them because of yesterday. It's too little, too late. It's fine to apologize afterwards. They just don't want their names in any more sleaz. No, his apology doesn't mean a thing to me. The Spectator's comments were widely circulated following the April 2016 verdict by the Hillsborough Inquest's second hearing proving unlawful killing of the 96 dead at Hillsborough. In November 2007, the BBC soap opera EastEnders caused controversy when the character Minty Peterson made a reference to the disaster. During the episode Car Mechanic Minty said, Five years out of Europe because of Heisel, because they penned you lot in to stop you fighting on the pitch and then what did we end up with? Hillsborough This prompted 380 complaints and the BBC apologised saying that the character was simply reminding another character, former football hooligan Jace Dyer, that the actions of hooligans led to the fencing in of football fans. Ofcom also received 177 complaints. Liverpool goalkeeper Charles Attange was accused of having shown disrespect towards the Hillsborough victims during the 2009 Remembrance Ceremony as he was spotted on camera smiling and nudging teammate Damien Plessis. He was suspended from the club for a fortnight and many fans felt he should not play for the club again. He was omitted from the first team squad and never played for the club in any capacity again. On June 28, 2010, Following England's departure from the 2010 FIFA World Cup competition in South Africa, the UK's culture and sports secretary Jeremy Hunt praised the England fans for their behaviour during the competition, saying I mean, not a single arrest for a football-related offence, and the terrible problems that we had in Heisel and Hillsborough in the 1980s seem now to be behind us. He later apologized and said I know that fan unrest played no part in the terrible events of April 1989 and I apologize to Liverpool fans and the families of those killed and injured in the Hillsborough disaster if my comments caused any offense. Margaret Aspinall, chairperson of the Hillsborough Family Support Group, asked for a face-to-face -face meeting with Hunt before deciding if she would accept the apology. Fans of rival football clubs such as Manchester United have been known to mention the Hillsborough disaster at fixtures to upset Liverpool fans. Following the findings of the independent panel in September 2012, Alex Ferguson and two Manchester United fan groups called for an end to the sick chance. Leeds United chairman Ken Bates endorsed this call in the club programme and stated, Leeds have suffered at times with reference to Galatasaray, some of our so-called fans have also been guilty as well, particularly in relation to Munich. This is a reference to the deaths of eight Manchester United players in the Munich Air disaster of 1958. In October 2011, Sir Oliver Popplewell who chaired the public inquiry into the 1985 Bradford City Stadium fire at Valley Parade that killed 56 people, called on the families of the Hillsborough victims to look at the quiet dignity and great courage relatives in the West Yorkshire city had shown in the years following the tragedy. He said, the citizens of Bradford behaved with quiet dignity and great courage. They did not harbour conspiracy theories. They did not seek endless further inquiries. They buried their dead, comforted the bereaved and succoured the injured. They organised a sensible compensation scheme and moved on. Is there, perhaps, a lesson there for the Hillsborough campaigners?
Popplewell was criticized for the comments, including a rebuke from a survivor of the Bradford fire. Labour MP Steve Rotheram, commented, How insensitive does somebody have to be to write that load of drivel? A formal complaint was made against David Crompton, South Yorkshire's chief constable, over internal emails relating to the Hillsborough disaster. In 2013 Crompton sent an email in which he said the family's version of certain events has become the truth even though it isn't. In September, David Crompton had emailed the force's assistant chief constable Andy Holt and head of media Mark Thompson on September 8, just four days before the Hillsborough Independent Panel report was published. The email came to light as the result of a Freedom of Information request. South Yorkshire's Police and Crime Commissioner Sean Wright has appointed Chief Constable Simon Parr of Cambridgeshire Constabulary to head the investigation. Wright said, the request has been submitted by a firm of solicitors in Liverpool acting on behalf of a number of individuals affected by the event. In March 2016, Crompton announced that he would retire in November. On April 26, 2016, after the inquest jury delivered a verdict affirming all the charges against the police, Crompton unequivocally accepted the verdicts, including unlawful killing, said that the police operation at the stadium on the day of the disaster had been catastrophically wrong, and apologized unreservedly. Following continued criticism of Crompton in the wake of the unlawful killing verdict, South Yorkshire Police and Crime Commissioner Alan Billings suspended Crompton from duty on April 27. In June 2014, an unnamed 24-year-old British civil servant was sacked for posting offensive comments about the disaster on Wikipedia. In 2009, Nearly 20 years to the day after the disaster, Stephen Cohen, a presenter on Fox Soccer Channel and Sirius Satellite Radio in the United States, stated on his radio show that Liverpool fans without tickets were the root cause and perpetrators of the disaster. A boycott of advertisers by American Liverpool fans eventually brought about an apology from him. Despite this he was replaced as presenter of Fox Football Phone-In. His actions were disowned by Chelsea Football Club and he no longer works as a broadcaster. In 1996, Sir Bernard Ingham, former press secretary to former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, caused controversy with his comments about the disaster. In a letter addressed to a victim's parent, Ingham wrote that the disaster was caused by tanked-up yobs. In another letter written to a Liverpool supporter, also written in 1996, Ingham remarked that people should shut up about Hillsborough. On the day of the inquest verdict, Ingham refused to apologise or respond to the previous comments he made, telling a reporter, I have nothing to say. There have since been calls to have Ingham stripped of his knighthood. In March 2018, British clothing retailer Topman marketed a T-shirt which was interpreted by members of the public including relatives of Hillsborough victims as mocking the disaster. The T-shirt was red with white details like a Liverpool shirt, and had the number 96 on the back like a football shirt with the text karma and what goes around comes back around, and a white rose, as associated with Yorkshire. Topman stated that the t-shirt was in reference to a Bob Marley song re-released in 1996 and apologized and withdrew the item. On May 20, 1989, a week after the disaster, Channel 4 broadcast a special live discussion football The Final Whistle. Bereaved parent Eileen Delaney was a guest, along with her husband James. Extracts from what she said can be read here and in Hillsborough The Truth by Phil Scraton.
The entire After Dark program can be accessed online here. A television drama film, based on the disaster and subsequent events, titled Simply Hillsboro, was produced by Granada Television. It was highly praised and won the BAFTA Award for Best Single Drama in 1997. Christopher Eccleston, Ricky Tomlinson, and Mark Womack were among the leading actors appearing in the film. It was aired for the first time in 1996, and has been aired four times since then, in 1998, 2009, in September 2012 on the weekend following the release of the findings of the Hillsboro Independent Panel, and again on May 1, 2016 on ITV. The American Sports Network ESPN, as part of its 30 for 30 series of sports films, aired the documentary Hillsboro as a CO production with the BBC. Directed by Daniel Gordon, the two-hour film chronicles the disaster, the investigations, and their lingering effects. It also included interviews with survivors, victims' relatives, police officers, and investigators. Hillsboro aired the first time on April 15, 2014, the 25th anniversary of the disaster. The documentary was unable to be shown in Great Britain upon initial release due to the 2012 High Court inquest still being Indiana Progress. The documentary includes previously unreleased security camera footage from the stadium on the day of the disaster. However, after the inquest verdict the BBC aired the documentary on May 8, 2016 with additional footage from the inquest and its final verdict. Two British stage plays also dealt with the disaster with different viewpoints.